41-year-old Victor Gunnarsson looked out the window of his small apartment in Salisbury, North Carolina. It was Wednesday afternoon, December 1st, 1993, and another mild winter had settled over the Tar Heel State. Even though Victor had lived in America now for almost eight years, the onset of what passed for cold in this part of the world still brought back sharp memories of the country where Victor was born and where he had expected, at one time, to spend his entire life. If Victor were waking up today in Sweden, 4,500 miles to the north and east of where he stood right now, he'd be welcoming the start of the coldest month of the year, with freezing temperatures that were nearly 20 degrees lower on average than where he lived now, and days so short that the sun would be setting by 3 p.m. in the afternoon. In Sweden, Victor would be piling on wool sweaters and overcoats. Here in Salisbury, he hardly ever had to wear anything warmer than his leather bomber jacket. Turning away from the window, Victor gave himself a small mental shrug. He felt lucky that he didn't miss his homeland more than he did, because for Victor, leaving Sweden had been a matter of necessity, not choice. Back in 1986, Victor's big talk about his anti-communist views, along with his right-wing activism, had gotten him in so much trouble that he'd basically been driven out of his politically liberal homeland. And even if he went back to Sweden's capital city of Stockholm, where he used to live, Victor knew he would not be any more welcome now than he had been eight years earlier. What still surprised the tall, handsome Swede with the dark hair and intense blue eyes was that he finally felt okay about all of that. When he'd had to leave Stockholm, he'd chosen the U.S. because he'd enjoyed the time he'd once spent vacationing in sunny California, but he'd wound up settling not on the West Coast, but here in central North Carolina, where the weather was warm, cost of living was reasonable, and where the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains were within a day's drive of the Lakewood apartment complex that Victor now called home. And here in the south of the United States, Victor's conservative views didn't raise so many eyebrows, and his naturally gregarious personality had meshed seamlessly with the region's legendary southern hospitality and friendliness. And it hadn't taken Victor long since he'd arrived before he'd put his ability to speak nine different languages to good use. Within weeks of getting settled here and advertising his services as a language tutor, Victor began to get so many requests for help that he'd had to start putting prospective students on a waiting list. Now, earning $50 an hour, which would be the equivalent of about $100 today, Victor wasn't rich, but he did feel financially comfortable. Victor had also very quickly found his niche in Salisbury as a ladies' man. From the second he had arrived, Victor made no bones about how much he enjoyed female company in every size, shape, and age. And even after the short but passionate affairs that Victor favored ended, he almost always remained on very friendly terms with his former lovers. The South was also a place where Victor, who liked to exaggerate when it came to describing his life experiences, found a willing audience. In addition to his magnetic personality, the fact that he was from Sweden and spoke so many languages gave him an exotic and cosmopolitan gloss that women and men found very interesting. Now, opening up one of the kitchen drawers and picking out a sharp paring knife, Victor thought about the latest woman in his life and smiled. Reaching for the fresh tomatoes that were piled on the counter in front of him, he put one of them on the cutting board and then looked down at his gold watch to check the time. Just five days ago, on the Friday after Thanksgiving, Victor had met a local high school teacher named Kay Whedon, who was housing a foreign exchange student from Denmark. And the attraction between Victor and Kay, who was 40 years old and, like Victor, divorced, had been immediate and very strong. The two of them had been brought together by a mutual friend who had told Kay that Kay's exchange student, Mikkel, who was there attending the local high school, might enjoy talking in his native language with Victor. Since that first meeting, Victor and Kay had spent a few more evenings with one another, and while their relationship was still purely platonic, Kay had asked Victor over to her house for dinner tonight so he could meet Mikkel and also Kay's 15-year-old only child, a son named Jason. Victor had been thrilled, and he told Kay not to worry about cooking, that he would provide the food, spaghetti with the homemade sauce he was now in the process of making. And if all went well, Victor thought, as he moved through the steps of a pasta recipe he knew by heart, maybe he and Kay, a smart and attractive woman who taught high school English and drama, would become more than just friends. On Friday, December 3rd, Victor got his wish. Victor's homemade spaghetti dinner two evenings earlier had been such a success that Kay was eager to move their relationship forward. 
Victor had headed off right away with both Mikkel and Jason, and now Kay wanted Victor to meet one of the most important people in Kay's life, Kay's 77-year-old mother, Catherine Miller. Even though she was 12 years past retirement age, Catherine was still working hard as an accounts clerk at W.A. Brown, an industrial refrigeration company that had been a local fixture in Salisbury for more than 80 years. Now a widow, Catherine devoted her spare time to church and volunteer activities and to playing a very big role in the lives of her grandson Jason and her only daughter Kay. And ever since Kay had moved to Salisbury after her divorce six years ago, Catherine had kept a very protective and, lately, a very worried eye on her daughter's love life. Catherine had heard all about an earlier date Kay had gone on back in November with a man named David Sumner, who Kay had met through a, quote, reputable dating agency, end quote. Their first get-together at a local lunch spot was promising, but the dinner date that followed a few days later had turned out to be a disaster. So when Kay had started talking about this intelligent and good-looking man named Victor, who was so different from Kay's expectation that a Swede would be pale-skinned and blonde, Catherine was very interested in meeting the new person in Kay's life. And when Kay had asked Catherine to join Kay and Victor at the Blue Bay Seafood Restaurant that night of December 3rd, Catherine hadn't hesitated even a second before saying yes. And now, as the three of them sat at a table for four near a window at Blue Bay and placed their dinner orders, Catherine thought that overall, Victor seemed friendly and courteous. He was definitely a talker, except when it came to exactly why he had left his home in Sweden's capital city of Stockholm eight years earlier. But then again, Catherine thought to herself, everyone had their secrets. And Catherine wondered how much Kay had told Victor about the problems that Kay had been having in her own life. It wasn't until the end of the meal, when Victor took his last bite of his baked potato and motioned to the server that he was ready for the check, that dinner hit one small sour note. That was when Victor took the money that Catherine had offered to him to cover the cost of her own meal, but instead of giving Catherine any change or refusing Catherine's offer, Victor used Catherine's money to pay the entire tab and the only contribution he made was to take a few dollars from his pocket and tuck them under his plate for the tip. A few minutes later, as Catherine, Victor, and Kay stood up and put on their coats before heading out the door and into the cool night air to the parking lot, Kay, who had also noticed this telltale sign that Victor was very likely tight with money, gave her mother an embarrassed shrug. Maybe, Catherine thought, as Victor held the car door of Kay's car open for Catherine to slide in before he stepped away to get into his own car to drive back to Lakewood Apartments where he lived, Victor didn't hate the welfare state, which is how he described Sweden, quite as much as he said he did, because he certainly didn't mind taking from the person who was supposed to be his guest. But later that night, when Kay and Victor were sitting outside in Kay's yard next to the fire pit, Kay, at least, had put that single awkward moment at the restaurant out of her mind. After dropping her mother off at 118 Larch Road and reminding her mom to make sure her alarm system was on for the night, Kay had headed back to her own house to wait for Victor, who had wanted to go to his own apartment and change into more comfortable clothing before coming back to join Kay. When Victor arrived at Sycamore Road, Jason and Mikkel were out with friends, which meant Kay and Victor had three hours alone together. When Jason and Mikkel got back to the house at about 10 p.m., Kay and Victor joined the teens and a few of their friends out in the side yard to enjoy a fire in the fire pit. Now, as Kay and Victor sat next to one another, their fingers entwined, Kay noticed the glint of a small diamond set in the heavy gold signet ring that Victor always wore on his left hand. When Kay asked about the ring, Victor took it off and told her that the three letters engraved around the diamond meant strength and courage. As their eyes met over the ring, Kay's heart skipped a beat especially after the hours that she and Victor had just spent alone. Kay hoped that there would be many more evenings just like this in the months ahead. Those thoughts were interrupted a few minutes later when Kay was startled by the sight of a car pulling into the end of her driveway. But a moment later, when she saw the car was just using her driveway to turn around and head back the way it had just come, she forced her shoulders to relax. An hour later, at about 11.15, Victor gave Kay's hand a gentle squeeze, then leaned over and told her that it was time for him to go back to his own apartment. And ten minutes after that, while Jason and his friends were still enjoying the fire, Kay was standing just inside the front door of the house saying goodnight to Victor. After a long kiss, Victor stepped back, smiled, and promised Kay he would call her the next day. 
Then, as Kay watched, the big man with black hair and intense blue eyes shoved his hands deep into his pockets, walked down the porch steps, and back to his car. 35 days later, and 100 miles northwest of Salisbury, a land surveyor working with a North Carolina state highway crew up in Waytaga County was picking his way through the dense woods off Highway 421, near the summit of one of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The highway department service vehicles were parked about 300 yards away alongside the edge of an entrance ramp leading onto the Blue Ridge Parkway, a scenic route through the mountain range that was closed at the moment due to uncleared ice and snow. As soon as the surveyor had stepped out of the warm vehicle, the cold mountain air and wind hit him like a fist. But after just a few steps, he had entered the relative shelter of thick trees. As he moved through the snow, the man's eyes swept back and forth across the ground just ahead of him. He didn't want to take any chances that he might miss the iron property marker he was looking for. After making his way around a large clump of mountain laurel, the surveyor stopped for a second to look up and take stock of his surroundings. Directly in front of him was a huge pine tree that had fallen or been knocked over by the wind. Facing the surveyor were the upended and snow-covered roots of the tree. And in the indentation in the earth where all those roots had once dug into the ground, the surveyor suddenly noticed something out of place in the snow just a few steps in front of him. The surveyor squinted, sure that his eyes were playing tricks on him. Then, moving much more slowly now, the man took one more step closer and then froze. Sticking out of the white snow immediately in front of the surveyor were two bare human feet. The toes and flesh of one foot had been chewed down to the bone by small animals, but the big toe on the left foot, large with a bristle of black hairs, a man's foot, was still intact. Suddenly gagging, the surveyor stumbled backward, then turned and ran a few yards back along the path he had just made through the snow. Then, pausing to catch his breath and looking over his shoulder again at the fallen pine tree, he dropped his case of equipment into the snow, opened his mouth, and yelled for help. By 2 p.m., the entrance ramp to the Blue Ridge Parkway was crowded with law enforcement vehicles and personnel. In response to the 911 call that had come in a few minutes earlier from the state highway crew reporting that what appeared to be a man's dead body had been found in the woods, two patrol cars from the Waytaga County Sheriff's Department had been first on the scene, where they were soon joined by members of the Blue Ridge National Park Service. By the time Detective Sergeant Paula May from the Division of Criminal Investigations in the Waitaga Sheriff's Department had arrived, the area around the fallen pine tree was taped off, and the surveyor, who had discovered the body under a mound of snow in the shadow of the upended tree roots, couldn't wait to give his statement to police, and then get out of the woods and back into a warm car as fast as possible. Detective May couldn't blame him. The temperature, already well below freezing, was dropping steadily. And this was only the beginning of what the six-year veteran with the sheriff's department knew would be a very long and very cold night. But in this case, the investigator also knew that in this situation, the cold and snow might work to the advantage of law enforcement. The large body that was clearly buried except for the feet under a mound of snow near the fallen pine tree had probably been well preserved by the recent cold temperatures. And if decomposition had been minimal, then the body might yield valuable clues about the identity of this person, along with the cause and time of their death. But aside from her assumption, based on the feet and the size of the body under the snow, that the victim was a man, the fact that the victim appeared to be naked raised more questions than answers. It basically ruled out two of the more common causes of death out here in the woods, suicide or an accident. And that left the third option, that what she was looking at here was likely a homicide. And that would open the door to a very complicated investigation, because murders could be committed for all kinds of reasons and by all kinds of people. And unless police found the man's clothing and some form of ID, there was also the challenge of finding out who this victim was. Detective May knew at the moment there were no active reports of missing people in Waytaga County. And even before she left the woods later that evening, she also knew that one of her first tasks would be to check on missing person reports outside of the county, both in the larger region and statewide. Within a few hours of Detective May's arrival, the Waytaga County Sheriff had already made a call to the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation asking for help. And not long after that, the area around the snow-covered body began to fill with members of a state crime tech unit and an agent assigned to work closely with Detective May. 
It wasn't until after the scene was photographed, sketched, and processed that the medical examiner oversaw the removal of the body. And after one small scoop of snow at a time had been lifted off the corpse, investigators finally got their first look at the nude adult white male who lay underneath the mound of snow. The bare skin of the man's back was frozen to the ground. His wide open mouth showed a set of straight white teeth. In his left temple, just below the line of dark hair that still covered what was left of his scalp, investigators could see a clearly defined circle where a bullet had been fired into his skull. And on the right side of the man's neck, there was a second bullet hole. There was no sign anywhere of the man's clothes and no shell casings from the rounds that were fired, but the body was not completely stripped. On the man's left wrist was a gold watch, and on his left hand, he wore a heavy gold signet ring with a small center diamond. The only other physical item left at the scene of what investigators now knew had to have been a murder was a 16-inch long strip of electrical and masking tape, the same kind of tape that investigators would later find had been used to bind the man's hands and ankles. By the next morning, when the medical examiner was preparing to conduct an autopsy on the body found in the woods the night before, Detective May had already made much more progress on the case than she had believed possible when she had first laid eyes on the dead man. In fact, she now believed she had identified their John Doe. The young detective had spent the night before at her office putting out a statewide call for active reports on missing adult middle-aged white males. And within hours, she had gotten a call from the police department in Salisbury, North Carolina, 90 miles to the southeast. The lieutenant told her about a 41-year-old Swedish national named Victor Gunnarsson, who had been reported missing by his landlord 23 days earlier on December 15, 1993. Victor's physical description, 41 years old, 6 foot 2 inches tall, 225 pounds, matched what Detective May had seen in the woods. But it was the recent photograph attached to the missing person's report from Salisbury that made the investigator's heart beat faster. The man in the photo with the dark hair and straight white teeth was wearing a gold watch and a heavy gold signet ring that looked exactly like the jewelry she had seen on the dead man in the woods. But it was what the Salisbury investigator told Detective May next when she asked what else the officer knew about Victor Gunnarsson that literally took Detective May's breath away. Because, as Detective May was about to find out, Victor Gunnarsson was no ordinary Swedish citizen. Victor Gunnarsson was in fact a major player in a political assassination that had taken place eight years earlier, an assassination that was still unsolved and still the subject of international intrigue and speculation. That assassination had taken place on the evening of Friday, February 28, 1986, in the capital city of Stockholm, Sweden, when the country's popular prime minister and his wife, unescorted by bodyguards, were walking home from an evening out at the movies. The assassin had walked up behind the couple and fired two bullets at close range. The first hit Olaf Palma in the back, killing him almost instantly, while the second bullet grazed and slightly injured Palma's wife, Lisbeth. And among the first suspects in that high-profile homicide was Victor Gunnarsson. Known at the time to Swedish police for his right-wing extremist views, Victor had been spotted earlier that same evening in a nearby bar where he had been heard ranting about the Prime Minister's socialist, economic, and foreign policies. Within hours of the shooting, Victor, who was then 33 years old, was picked up for questioning and then let go only to be brought back into police custody two more times for detention and interrogation. He was finally released after an eyewitness to the assassination could not positively identify Victor as the shooter. But being released from police custody was not at all the same thing as being cleared of suspicion. As long as the case went unsolved, Victor remained a person of interest. As the target of continued surveillance as well as public mistrust, Victor had trouble keeping a job and living a normal life. So, after receiving a settlement for wrongful detention from the government, Victor decided it was time to leave Sweden and start a new life in America, where he eventually settled in Salisbury, North Carolina. 
Within days of Detective May's discovery, Swedish officials were able to confirm that the fingerprints taken from the man found in the North Carolina woods did match those of Victor Gunnarsson. By that time, the autopsy report had also come back. The contents in Victor's stomach, which included bits of potato skin, showed that he had probably eaten dinner about four hours before his death. The medical examiner had also determined that Victor had been bound with masking and electrical tape and confirmed that Victor had been killed execution style with one bullet to the head and one to the throat. The cause of death immediately ignited speculation in the US and in Sweden that Victor himself had become the victim of an assassination and that his death must be related somehow to the 1986 murder of the Swedish Prime Minister. But as detectives in both Waitaga County, where Victor's body was found, and in Salisbury, where Victor lived, began to work the homicide case together, what increasingly drew their attention wasn't just Victor's link to an eight-year-old political assassination, it was Victor's link to Salisbury resident and high school teacher Kay Whedon. What made that link interesting to detectives was the fact that Victor was not the only recent homicide victim who had lived in Salisbury and been a part of Kay's life. By now, results from Victor's autopsy, coupled with information detectives had gathered from Victor's friends and neighbors and from Kay herself, had helped police narrow the date of Victor's actual death to early December probably around December 3rd, which was when Victor had gone out to dinner with Kay and eaten the baked potato, bits of which were later found inside of his stomach. And it was just a few days after December 3rd, on December 9th, that Kay Whedon's mother, 77-year-old Catherine Miller, had also been murdered. And like Victor, she had been shot twice in the head at close range. So, even as Detective May and law enforcement from the state and Salisbury Police Department continued to track down any information they could about Victor's political activities here in the United States, investigators also focused their attention on finding out all they could about Kay, the one person who represented the strongest link between two very similar brutal homicides that claimed the lives of two Salisbury residents. By the time Detective May joined forces with Salisbury investigators in mid-January, Salisbury police had already discovered that Kay herself also appeared to be in potential danger. Since Victor's disappearance and the death of her mother, Kay and her son Jason had both become the targets of telephone calls and letters accusing Jason of involvement with local drug dealers and threatening both mother and son with physical violence. When Kay sat down with investigators to tell them about her relationship with Victor, she told detectives that she had been crushed when Victor had not followed through on his promise to call her the day after their dinner together at the Blue Bay restaurant on December 3rd. But any worry or hurt Kay had felt about Victor's sudden silence and apparent disappearance and any concern over the apparent stalker or stalkers who had started sending these awful letters and calling her and her son at all hours to threaten them had been totally blotted out of her mind when she received the terrible news on December 9th that her mother had been murdered. That was the morning that Catherine's body had been found by a co-worker from W.A. Brown who had been so concerned that Catherine was late to work that he went directly to her home on Larch Street to make sure she was okay. When the co-worker had stepped into Catherine's kitchen, he'd been horrified to find Catherine slumped in a seated position on the floor, her back against a white refrigerator and the top of her head blown off. After ruling out both Kay and her son Jason as suspects, police concentrated first on interviewing Catherine's friends and co-workers. Even though Catherine's house had a security system installed, there was no sign of forced entry, which made police believe the older woman must have known her attacker and opened the door to let them in. But after finding zero evidence that anyone close to Catherine would want her dead, police turned their attention again to Kay thinking that Catherine's murder might be connected to something going on in Kay's life or to someone close to Kay. People of interest had included Kay's former boyfriend, a Salisbury police officer named Lamont Claxton Underwood, who worked as a resource officer at Salisbury High School, as well as other men like David Sumner, who Kay had dated after she broke up with Officer Underwood and before she met Victor Gunnarsson. But no matter how hard they probed, detectives couldn't find any physical evidence to link anyone in Kay's circle of friends and acquaintances to the murder of Catherine Miller. But after the discovery of Victor's body, investigators in Salisbury had additional leads to follow. 
It looked to Detective May and Salisbury's lead investigator Don Gale like Victor Gunnarsson must have been kidnapped from his home in Salisbury and transported, probably by car, up to Waitaga County where he was actually killed. But even after circling back to Officer Underwood, who had re-entered Kay's life as a friend after Kay's mother had died, and who had access to firearms, police still came up empty. All police discovered when they searched their fellow officer's home and car on February 1st, 1994, was that Lamont Claxton, LC for short, was neat to the point of being compulsive about order and cleanliness. As for a connection between Victor's murder and the assassination of Sweden's prime minister in 1986, that lead also petered out. Years before, Victor had apparently cut his ties to any right-wing extremist groups, and state and local police in North Carolina could not find one scrap of evidence among Victor's personal belongings or information gathered through interviews with his associates that related in any way to the death of Prime Minister Olaf Palma. By the fall of 1994, 11 months after Victor Gunnarsson disappeared from his apartment in Salisbury, all the main characters in the unsolved murders of Victor and also Catherine Miller had started to move on with their lives. Kay, unable to stand being so close to the home where her mother had died, sold her house on Sycamore Road and moved to a new home five miles to the south, and the harassment that had terrorized her and Jason stopped. Both Kay and Elsie Underwood each had new romantic partners, and no one had stepped forward to claim a $50,000 reward offered by North Carolina's governor for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Victor's murderer. Just as no one in Salisbury or Waitaga County responded to a police bulletin asking for information about the 22 caliber weapon used to kill Victor, or the 38 caliber weapon used to kill Catherine. It wouldn't be until the fall of 1995, almost two years after Salisbury's 24,000 residents had been shaken to the core by those two homicides, that Waitaga County Detective Paula May and Salisbury Detective Don Gale would get the news they had been hoping for, news that would once again shine the international spotlight on Victor Gunnarsson. On Wednesday, October 11th, an analyst for the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation placed a call to Detective May at her office up in the northwest corner of the state. After almost two years of reviewing the evidence and material samples that had been collected in the course of the Victor Gunnarsson investigation and finding nothing that would ID the murderer, the forensics expert had been ready to give up. But as he packed away one particular piece of material, he made a completely unexpected discovery. And using a brand new tool for analyzing DNA, the agent now believed he knew who had kidnapped and killed Kay's one-time boyfriend, Victor. Based on the results of that DNA test and the information investigators had gathered over the last two years, here is a reconstruction of what happened to Victor Gunnarsson on the night of December 3, 1993, and what happened to Catherine Miller five days later on the night of December 9th. It was right around midnight and the moon was covered by clouds when Victor's killer turned into the parking lot at Lakewood Apartments and spotted Victor's big gray Lincoln Town car parked right in front of Unit 910. The killer smiled at the lighted window of Victor's apartment. That was good. That meant the big Swede was still awake. Pulling the burgundy-colored Monte Carlo sedan in as close to Victor's unit as possible, the killer rolled to a stop and turned off the engine. Before leaving the car, the killer checked that they had everything they needed. Then there was the soft clunk as the car door closed, and then the quiet slap of footsteps as the killer walked to the front door of Victor's unit and rang the bell. A moment later, there was the sound of movement inside the apartment, then the doorknob turned, and the big friendly Swede suddenly appeared standing right inside. But the expression of puzzled welcome on Victor's face didn't last long. As soon as the door had opened, the killer was on the move, crowding Victor further back into the house and pulling out the 22 caliber pistol borrowed from a friend. Before Victor even had time to wrap his mind around what had just happened and who was standing inside his home, Victor was being forced out the door of his apartment, bands of tape covering his mouth and binding his hands tightly behind his back. Prodding Victor ahead of him to the Monte Carlo, the killer popped open the trunk and forced Victor to climb inside the cramped compartment before quickly wrapping Victor's ankles together with more strips of electrical and masking tape. 
Then there was another clunk as the killer closed the trunk and stepped around to the driver's side, hopped behind the wheel, and turned on the engine. The killer paused just long enough to take a few calming breaths before easing slowly out of the apartment complex, the door to Victor's unit still open. The drive north from Salisbury to the intersection of Route 421 and the Blue Ridge Mountain Parkway took about an hour and 45 minutes. Coming from the rear of the car, the killer could hear the sound of Victor kicking at the top and sides of the trunk and the occasional scrape of something hard that sounded like metal on metal. As the killer approached the entrance ramp to the parkway, they slowed down, pulled over, and then parked the car. Here in the mountains, the edges of the road gave way almost immediately to thick, dense forest. And at this time of the year, when the parkway closed due to winter snow and ice, it could be months or never before anyone wandered into these woods, which was good because that meant the killer could finish this thing without hiking more than three or 400 yards into that black tangle of branches. Another calming breath, and the killer had gotten out of the driver's seat, closed the car door, and walked to the trunk. All the thumping and scraping had stopped. Time to pop the trunk, cut the bindings around Victor's ankles, and bring part one of the killer's plan to a close. A few minutes later, after forcing Victor to walk ahead at gunpoint up a slight hill, the killer skirted around the edge of a thicket of mountain laurel, then ordered Victor to stop walking. Facing them was the upended root ball of a fallen pine tree. Backing Victor into the shallow depression just in front of the snow-covered roots, the killer ordered Victor to strip off all of his clothes. Then, the killer wrapped a strip of masking and electrical tape around Victor's forehead. Pressing the barrel of the 22 against the tape on the left side of Victor's temple, right at the hairline, the killer pulled the trigger. Once Victor had fallen backward into the snow, the killer crouched down and quickly fired a second shot through the right side of Victor's throat. A moment later, and the killer had picked up the two spent shell casings and was pulling off the tape from around Victor's mouth and forehead and hands and adding the strips with their incriminating load of DNA from Victor's hair and skin to the pile of Victor's clothing. As the killer's adrenaline rush started to wear off, the killer was suddenly shaky and very eager to get out of the dark woods. With any luck, no one would ever see Victor Gunnarsson again. The winter, snow, cold, and wild animals who would scatter his bones all over the forest would make sure of that. As the killer gathered up trace evidence and stood to walk back out to the road, the killer never noticed the 16-inch long strip of masking and electrical tape they had dropped close to Victor's bare feet. Five days later, Victor's killer was ready to complete the second part of their plan. All the risks were worth it. Because after this, the killer was sure that the life they had wanted and planned would finally be within reach. So, on the evening of December 8, 1993, the killer knocked at the front door of Catherine Miller's house at 118 Larch Road. The single-story brick ranch was set far back from the road, so anyone driving by would have a hard time recognizing the person who stood with their back to the street at the top of the front steps. After the killer called out and identified themselves, the door opened... Catherine looked surprised and not completely pleased, but she still stepped back to allow her visitor inside. With the same wave of excitement the killer had felt entering Victor's apartment a few days earlier, the killer now pushed quickly into Catherine's living area. The sooner this was done, the better. Pulling out the gun, this time it was a 38 caliber revolver, the killer forced Catherine through the front of her house to the kitchen out back. There was a pan of beans for Catherine's dinner heating on the stove, and a copy of that day's Salisbury Post newspaper lying on the kitchen table. Catherine had turned, and then with no place left to go, she came to a stop with her back pressed against the refrigerator. Then, as the killer closed the distance left between them, Catherine stumbled, slipped, or simply slid down the door of the refrigerator until she was in a sitting position on the floor. Then, standing next to her, the killer fired two bullets down into the top of Catherine's head, sending fragments of bone, scalp, and hair in a spray along the floor and ceiling, and leaving a fan of blood spatter against the white refrigerator door. Stepping back, and careful to avoid stepping in any blood, the killer spent a few minutes staging the house to look like Catherine had been the victim of a robbery gone wrong. But the only thing of any value that police would find missing was Catherine's purse. 
Satisfied with their work, the killer left Catherine's house, returned to their car, started up the engine, and drove away, already thinking ahead to the sequence of events that would begin tomorrow morning. As soon as police discovered Catherine's dead body, they would inform Catherine's daughter, who lived just a few blocks away. And that was the moment when Salisbury police officer L.C. Underwood would be ready to reap the reward of having murdered the two people who stood between him and Kay Whedon, the woman he loved and wanted. With Victor gone, L.C. had eliminated his chief romantic rival, and with Catherine Miller dead, L.C. had eliminated the person closest to Kay, and the person who had never approved of her daughter's involvement with the police officer who had heard all about how Elsie Underwood had showed up at the restaurant where Kay had met David Sumner for dinner, threatened to hurt both of them, and then dumped a full glass of iced tea right into Kay's lap. Now, with Victor and Catherine dead, not only would L.C. become Kay's indispensable man, L.C. was also the only person who could put an end to the harassment that had made Kay's life miserable ever since she had broken off her engagement to him a little over one year earlier. That part would be easy, since it was L.C. himself who had been Kay's stalker all along, sending her those threatening letters he had typed on a typewriter at his work office and arranging for an ex-convict L.C. knew to harass Kay by phone. Just as it had been so easy for Elsie Underwood to drive by Kay Whedon's house on the night of December 3rd, when Kay and Victor sat holding hands together outside by the fire pit, turn around in the end of her driveway and take down the license number of Victor's car, then call up a buddy on the police force to run the plates and give Elsie Victor's home address. And not only had Elsie been able to use the power of his badge to help commit murder, his job as a police officer would allow him to keep an eye on the investigation into both deaths and stay one step ahead of investigators. But what Elsie Underwood did not expect when he killed both Victor and Catherine was that despite his mania for cleanliness and sanitizing a crime scene, he would leave behind three critical pieces of evidence that would eventually lead to his arrest. It would turn out that even before Catherine Miller had been murdered, Salisbury police, who were investigating Kay Whedon's reports that someone was harassing her, had already developed evidence that Kay's own ex-boyfriend, Elsie Underwood, was also Kay's stalker. Police had seized the typewriter ribbon from Elsie's work typewriter at the local high school where he was a resource officer. That typewriter ribbon was the first piece of critical evidence that would eventually tie Elsie to murder. On that typewriter ribbon, police found words that appeared in the letters of harassment that Kay had shown police. Even though Kay herself had refused to believe that L.C. could be her stalker, when Kay's mother, Catherine, was murdered, L.C., who had been vocal about his run-ins with Catherine, quickly became investigator's primary suspect. But it wasn't until Victor Gunnarsson's body was discovered, naked and dead up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, that police were able to collect the second and third pieces of evidence that would send Elsie to prison. When police searched Elsie's house back in February of 1993, almost two months after Victor's disappearance, they found a roll of electrical tape that they were later able to identify as the same kind of tape as the strip of tape that police found at the scene of Victor's murder. And during that same search, in the trunk of Elsie's Monte Carlo, there were boot prints and scratches on the underside of the lid. And even though Elsie had had the car thoroughly and professionally cleaned, when detectives sent in the mats from the bottom of the trunk to the state crime lab for examination, forensic specialists would eventually recover 17 hairs embedded in the mat fibers. The call that Detective Paula May had received on October 11, 1995, was confirmation from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab that DNA from all 17 of those hairs found in the trunk of Elsie Underwood's Monte Carlo were a match for Victor Gunnarsson. On October 13, 1995, one day after receiving those DNA results, and just under two years after Victor disappeared, Police arrested 44-year-old police officer L.C. Underwood and charged him with first-degree murder and first-degree kidnapping in the death of Swedish national Victor Gunnarsson. Three and a half years later, on Monday, July 21, 1997, Lamont Claxton Underwood was found guilty of both charges and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Although the court allowed the prosecution to present evidence from Catherine Miller's murder as part of the state's case against Elsie Underwood, 
Elsie Underwood was never formally charged with Catherine's murder. On Christmas Day 2018, after serving 21 years of his life sentence, Elsie Underwood died in prison of kidney cancer at the age of 67. In June 2020, 34 years after Victor Gunnarsson was questioned as a possible suspect in the assassination of Sweden's Prime Minister Olaf Palma, Swedish prosecutors announced that they had finally solved the puzzle of who really did shoot Olaf Palma. According to prosecutors, the man, who had no connection to Victor, was a professional graphic designer who had put himself forward at the time of the assassination as an eyewitness to the Prime Minister's death. As for Victor Gunnarsson, twice in his life, the big talker with the big smile was in absolutely the wrong place at absolutely the wrong time. His first piece of bad luck, when he was in a bar nearby the place where Olaf Palma was gunned down, resulted in Victor's persecution and his move to the United States. The second piece of bad luck, when he met Kay Whedon, a woman he would date for less than a month, resulted in Victor's death. On Tuesday, September 11, 2001, 30-year-old Michael Wright hopped into a crowded elevator and pressed the number 81. Michael was an account executive for a telecommunications company that operated out of New York's famous World Trade Center. The World Trade Center was located in the financial district of Lower Manhattan. It was made up of seven different buildings. Michael's building was one of the two identical, massive, 110-story tall skyscrapers that were collectively called the Twin Towers, and then separately they were called the North Tower and the South Tower. Michael's company was in the North Tower. Once the elevator reached floor 81, the doors opened up and Michael squeezed his way out of the car and right ahead of him, on the wall right in front of him, he would have seen three other elevator doors and then on the wall behind him there would have been another three elevator doors, one of which he just exited. To his right there was just a wall and then to his left was a set of glass doors that fed out into this big hallway that wrapped all the way around the building. Now, this hallway, there were offices on either side as you went around the 81st floor but while you were in this hallway, you couldn't actually look out the windows and see this incredible view of New York. The views were only accessible once you were inside of these various office buildings. And so Michael, he gets out of the elevator, he turns left, he goes through those doors, and then he turns right and he starts walking down this hallway and then he stops in front of this wooden door on his left. And this was the door to his company, which was called Networks Plus. So he opens that up and right in front of him is this huge open office space with all these cubicles and even though it was quite early, dozens of his co-workers were already there with their headsets on and they're chatting and clicking away on their computers. But Michael was not in a rush. He had a morning routine and he was not about to break it now. And so he just strolled into the room, he said hi to a couple people, and he walked as if he was going towards the very back of the office towards the windows. But just before he reached the windows, he found his cubicle on the right. And so he dropped his bag next to his chair, but he didn't sit down. Instead, he just kept on walking, he turned right, and he went down this corridor, and then he turned right and he was facing this cafeteria. And the cafeteria for the company, it was really just this small room with a couple of tables and chairs. There was a fridge, there was a coffee machine. It was really just kind of a lounge area. So he went in there and he grabbed a paper cup, he filled it with coffee, and then he grabbed a bran muffin that was on a community tray. And then he left the cafeteria and went back to his desk. He sat down and when he sat down, it was 7.45 a.m. And so he didn't immediately turn on his computer and throw his headset on and just dive into work. Instead, he just kind of enjoyed his coffee, enjoyed his bran muffin, and thought about what he was going to do that day. Typically, on Tuesdays, Michael would go out and see clients, and he would make some sales calls. And so Michael was just kind of sitting there, getting his head right for the day, and then after he finished his breakfast, he threw on his headset, he powered up his computer, he checked his email, he started calling around to different clients to set up meetings for later that day. And then around 8.40 a.m., Michael realized he had to go to the bathroom. And so Michael took off his headset, he stood up, he turned around, he left his cubicle, and then instead of walking deeper into the office towards the windows in the cafeteria, he turned left and started walking back towards the main door that fed into his office. So he gets to this door, he opens it up, he steps out into the main hallway, and then he turns left and starts walking away from where the elevators are. Those are down to his right. And so he walks maybe 10 or 15 feet down this main hallway before he reaches a door to the men's room, which is on his right. And so he notices on the door, there's this sign that he hadn't seen before that said, please keep the bathroom clean. So he reads the sign, doesn't think much of it, pushes the door open, and when he gets in there, there's a couple of his male colleagues that are kind of yucking it up in the corner. And they're actually laughing about the sign that was on the bathroom door. 
Bank of America had just recently moved into the 81st floor. So now Michael and his company were sharing this floor with Bank of America and Bank of America had put that sign on the bathroom door. And so the guys were saying, oh, so you come into our space and the first day you're here, you're telling us we're dirty. And so Michael, he kind of laughed along with them because once he put it in context, it did seem kind of passive aggressive. At 8.46 a.m., Michael turned away from this group of laughing guys and began walking over to the urinals on the wall. But before he even got to the urinals, suddenly the building jolted hard to one side. Now, the Twin Towers were built to withstand very heavy winds, and so the way they were constructed to do that was they would flex several inches in any direction at any time. But this was not several inches, this was several feet. And it was so violent and so sudden that the marble on the walls actually cracked and fell off. And the guys in the bathroom, most of them lost their balance and fell to the ground. And the one guy who was inside of a stall, he comes running out, he bursts the door open, he's buttoning his pants up, and he's screaming, what was that? Michael, after standing back up, began thinking to himself, you know, did I hear a sound? Was there an explosion? You know, what was that? It must have been a, a gas main explosion. What else could that have possibly been? There was just nothing else he could think of that would account for that big of a shift. But there was just no time to sit there and dwell on how this happened because the alarms in the building started going off. And so Michael and the other guys that were in there, they just left the bathroom to go out to the hallway to see what was going on. And when Michael got out there, he looked left down the main hallway, past his office, all the way down to the elevators. And all the way down there, he could see there was clearly fire spitting out of the elevator lobby area. And so before Michael could even process that there was this fire and what he was going to do about it, he heard screaming, a woman screaming behind him. The women's bathroom was right next to the men's bathroom. And so Michael and a couple of the other guys who had been in the bathroom with him, they go running into the women's room. And there was this stall, this bathroom stall in the women's room that had been kind of bent over. And it would turn out during the shift in the building, the door jam on one of the stalls had folded over, kind of locking it in place. And there was a woman on the other side of the stall. There was a woman in the stall. And so that was the woman who was screaming. And so the men, they get in there, they start kicking and punching the store, trying to get it open. And finally they do, and they're able to pull this woman out. They go back out into the hallway and right away, Michael notices there is a cloud of white smoke that is filling the entire hallway. It's towards the top. So they can kind of duck down to avoid the smoke. And so Michael's hunched down and he looks left down the hallway towards where he knows this fire is. And he sees the fire has gotten much larger and the flames have jumped into the hallway. It's still pretty far away, but clearly this fire is spreading. And so Michael, he's crouched down and he's watching as people are streaming out of his office down the hall and everyone's kind of avoiding this fire. They're running up to where Michael and the others have congregated. Michael, who's crouched down, he's still kind of just looking generally towards the fire, almost stunned when he notices something about the ground. There was this huge crack in the ground that ran from where he was all the way down the hall, all the way to the fire. And then Michael turned around and saw that crack actually continued all the way in the other direction. It looked like the floor had literally broken in half and it was like the floor was gonna fall off the building. And so as Michael is crouched down, just staring at this crack, not really sure what to think about it, he started to listen to what people were saying in the hall. Everyone's beginning to speculate about what caused this fire, what caused the building to shift like that. And a lot of people tended to believe it was a gas main explosion, which is what Michael thought. Other people suggested, you know, maybe it was an earthquake and some outliers said it could have been a bomb. But little did anybody know what had happened to their building was far worse than anything they could have imagined. A few minutes earlier at 8.46 a.m., as Michael stood in the bathroom kind of yucking it up with the other guys that were in there, American Airlines Flight 11, which was this massive 767 passenger airplane carrying 91 passengers, five of which were the hijackers, they slammed into Michael's tower 12 floors above Michael's head. The plane was traveling at about 466 miles per hour when it struck the building. The impact and subsequent explosion immediately killed not only everyone on board the plane, but hundreds of people that were inside of the impact zone, which was between floors 93 and 99. The plane also went right through the building, severing all of the stairwells and the elevator shafts, meaning anyone who was still alive from floors 93 all the way to the top, floor 110, 
all those people, they didn't have an escape route anymore. So they were trapped, they just didn't know it yet. And to make an already horrible situation even worse, after this plane detonates inside of the North Tower, it sends 9,000 gallons of burning jet fuel down these destroyed elevator shafts. And as this fuel tumbled, it would splash onto many of the floors below, like floor 81. The fuel would kind of splash through the openings to the elevator doors. And once a little bit had landed on that floor, the whole floor would catch on fire. But Michael and the rest of the people on floor 81 were completely oblivious to this. All they knew was there's a fire over there, and so we need to get away from it. But as Michael stood up from this crack and began kind of looking around to see what they were going to do next, he noticed that most of the people, while they were staying calm, were not really running to evacuate. They were just kind of standing around and the different business managers from different departments were just kind of telling their staff members to stay calm and hold on, let's get our thoughts together. And Michael, who was not panicked, at least not yet, he's looking around thinking, you know what, let's just get off this floor. We need to get off this floor. And so he remembered that a lot of his friends, they would sneak out of the office and they would smoke cigarettes in this one particular emergency stairwell that was close to them. And so Michael just started yelling to the group, hey, we gotta go now, now, we need to leave. There's stairs over there, follow me. And so Michael kind of cut through the crowd and the crowd was very quick to respond. They kind of followed him and he opened the door, he goes into the stairwell and he lets some people go in. And before long, there's a very orderly double file line making their way down the stairwell. Michael remembers after he joined this double file line and began going down the steps, this immediate sense of relief, especially after they got down a couple of flights away from the 81st floor. Because in his mind and in a lot of other people's minds that were in the stairwell with him, the problem was up there. It was the 81st floor, there was this one fire, it was localized, it would be dealt with, and they're already all the way down here, they'll be out of the building soon, so they got nothing to worry about. And so Michael and the rest of his co-workers just kept making their way down the stairs, it was very slow progress, and sometimes it would come to a complete standstill because other people on lower floors were entering the stairwell and joining in in this evacuation. But Michael remembers nobody was freaking out, no one was panicking. There were some people that, you know, were more worked up about it, but there really was this sense of safety, that they were in these stairs and that everything was going fine. And so as they're kind of making their way down, most people were concerned with trying to place a call to their family to just tell them, hey, you know, I'm okay, this crazy thing happened at work today, but, you know, I'm going to be fine. Michael had left his cell phone on his desk, so he didn't have a way to call his family. He got a co-worker to give him his phone, and Michael tried dozens of times to reach his wife, Jenny, but when he called her, she didn't pick up, and so eventually he just gave the phone back to his co-worker and just continued down the steps. At about 9 a.m., so that would have been about 10 or 12 minutes into this evacuation down the stairs, Michael, who again is in relatively good spirits, he knows there's danger upstairs, but you know, they're safe down here, he makes this kind of off-color joke to lighten the mood in the stairwell. Michael turns to one of his male colleagues and pretends to confess his love to him and tells him, the only reason I'm confessing it to you now is because we're going to die here anyways. Now, the joke here in Michael's mind was, of course we're not going to die here. He was intentionally dramatizing the entire situation because they were safe. They were in the stairwell. They were evacuating. The fire was up there. They're down here. Everything is fine. And some people thought the joke was kind of funny and they laughed at it. But the guy right ahead of Michael didn't think it was funny, and he turned around and looked at Michael and said, hey man, you gotta keep your humor down in here. So Michael, he did immediately regret telling his joke, but not because he was suddenly scared that this situation was far more dangerous than he was realizing, but because he just felt bad for offending some people. Michael would later reflect on this moment, and he would say he was so naive that even though he had seen the fire and seen the physical damage, that crack on the ground and the marble falling off the wall, that despite all that, it was like he just couldn't fathom that they were actually in any real danger inside of the stairwell. He really thought they were going to be just fine. But of course, as history would show us, Michael was wrong. Around the time that Michael was scolded for his off-color joke, about 200 feet to the south of the tower they were in, another passenger airplane, United Airlines Flight 175, crashed into the south side of the south tower. All 65 passengers on board, which included the five hijackers, were killed instantly. The plane was traveling at about 590 miles an hour when it struck the South Tower, and it hit between floors 77 and 85, killing hundreds of people in the impact site and trapping hundreds more above it. And then just like the North Tower, after this plane detonated inside of the South Tower, 
it sent thousands of gallons of burning jet fuel down these destroyed elevator shafts, igniting fires on many floors below. Despite being so physically close to this second plane crash, Michael didn't hear it, and apparently no one else in the stairwell did either, or they just didn't recognize it for what it was. And so Michael and the others just continued walking down the stairwell thinking everything was fine. Around 9.30 a.m., so that's about 40 minutes into their evacuation, Michael and the rest of his co-workers reached floor 40, and this was the first time they saw firefighters, New York firefighters, running up the stairs to go fight this fire. And so naturally, Michael and the others asked the firemen if they knew what had caused this fire, what was going on. But the firefighters just said, look, we don't know exactly what caused this, but go down, it's safe down there. Michael would remember about seeing these firefighters that they all had a similar look on their face. They had this kind of stoic, just kind of neutral look on their face, very calm, very mission oriented as they charged up the stairs in all this heavy gear. But years later, as Michael reflected on that situation, he thinks about their faces, and now he believes the look they had on their face was actually fear. And unfortunately, most of the firefighters that ran past Michael and the others and went up to fight that fire in the North Tower, they would all perish. A few minutes later, Michael and the others made it down to floor 30, and right around the time they got there, they heard people behind them, above them from higher floors, yelling for people to get out of the way. And so Michael turned around and looked up and he saw there were some people carrying other people down the stairs and they were trying to clear a path to get these injured people down. And so Michael, like everybody else, kind of sucked up against the side of the wall to let these people pass. And when they did, he saw there were two injured people. There was one guy who his whole shirt had been burned off of his back, exposing his bare back, and he had burns on the top of his shoulder. And then the other injured person was this woman with severe burns on her face. After they passed, Michael and the people around him kind of got back in line and just kept moving down the stairs, but now they were on edge. Everyone was kind of thinking to themselves, you know, how bad is this fire? Who else got hurt? What actually happened up there? A few minutes later, Michael and his co-workers got down to floor 20, and that's when they saw there was this firefighter yelling to everyone, asking, hey, does anybody know CPR? I need volunteers who know CPR. And so Michael, he had been trained in CPR 10 years earlier in college, and while he hadn't done it in a while, he felt confident that push came to shove, he could do it. And so he and another guy that was near him volunteered to be the CPR guys. And so they went over to this firefighter who explained to them, you know, stay right here and be ready to do CPR on anyone that is brought down to you. And if anybody else needs help, I need you to try to help them too. So just basically be here as a resource. And so Michael and the other volunteers say no problem and they stay right there. And the firefighter grabs all of his heavy equipment and he charges up the stairs. Over the next 10 minutes, Michael and this other guy did not need to perform CPR. However, they did assist one very heavy man that was having a very hard time breathing. They helped walk him down all the way to the bottom. And then Michael and the other volunteer, they turned around and ran back up to the 20th floor. And as they're running up, they're asking everyone around them, hey, do you need help, do you need help? But nobody needed any help. And so when they got back up to the 20th floor, they were there for a couple more minutes. And then by about 9.50 a.m., there were no more people coming down the stairs. It was just Michael and this other volunteer. And so that's when they decided that it's time to go. And so they bounded down the stairs and they got all the way to the ground floor at about 9.55 a.m. And Michael, he opened the door that led out to the ground floor, which was the plaza level. And what he saw was the worst thing he had ever seen in his life. The people that were located in the North and South Tower above the impact sites would have eventually realized they did not have an escape route. Stairwells were blocked, the elevators didn't work, and so naturally the only way to go was up. And so I'm sure initially there was some speculation amongst these people that a helicopter could come up and get them, or some other way they were going to be rescued. We just need to get higher and higher and higher. But eventually they got to the roof and they got to the upper levels and there was no rescue. And the fire that was raging below them from the jet fuel, it was growing and creeping higher and higher and all this black smoke was leaking into the vents of these upper floors. And so the heat and the smoke and the flames, it was driving these people to the absolute top of this building 
And eventually, these people who were trapped, they would have realized there isn't a rescue that's going to get us in time. We're doomed. And so these poor people, in their final moments, they picked up their phones and they called their loved ones one more time. And so there are all these totally heartbreaking messages of these trapped people calling their family to say how much they love them and how much they're going to miss them. And there are an equal number of messages of these people calling their family to say how scared they are, that they're not ready to die. Eventually, the fire, the heat, the smoke would become so intense that these trapped people would actually go outside the building and would hang on to the windows, dangling hundreds and hundreds of feet off the ground because there was nowhere else to go. And then eventually, when all hope was lost, these mothers and fathers, these wives, these husbands, these sisters, these brothers, these daughters, these sons, these friends, they began jumping off of the tower to their death. Almost all of them jumped alone, but at least one eyewitness saw a couple holding hands. One woman who was falling in a final act of modesty held her skirt down. Other people tried to make parachutes out of tablecloths and curtains, but as soon as they jumped, these things were ripped from their hands. The fall from the upper floors of both towers took about 10 seconds, and when their bodies hit the ground, they weren't just broken, they were obliterated. And so Michael, when he opens this door, he steps out into this lobby that's at the plaza level, and he turns and he looks at this huge set of windows that look out into this 200-foot-long stretch of open pavement that separates the North Tower that he is in with the South Tower. And scattered all across this stretch of pavement are about 50 different bodies. The majority of these people had jumped. The rest were either people that had fallen out of the tower from the impact of the plane, or they were passengers on board one of the two planes that actually hit the towers. Michael had no way of processing what he was looking at, because as far as he understood, there was just this fire at the top of the tower he was in. How could all these people be out here? What happened to them? And so as he's scanning the absolute horrors outside, he also sees there is blood all over the windows. And that was from the people that had fallen close to the building. And so as he's seeing all this blood and this carnage, he just puts his hand up over his eyes. Like he doesn't want to look at what's going on outside. He just can't possibly process it. And so instead, he and this other guy, they say, okay, let's not go outside. Because if we go outside, something could land on us. A person could land on us. We don't know what's going on out there. Let's go down one more level. Because there was another set of stairs right ahead of them in the lobby that went down to the shopping mall. And the shopping mall extended outside away from the tower. And there was street access, maybe a half a block away. And so Michael and this other guy he was with, they run over to the stairs. They go down into the shopping mall. And down there, it's dark and the sprinklers are going off. And they just start running through this mall, trying to get to these stairs that'll bring them back up to the street level. And as they're going, they run into another group of people that are doing the same thing. And one of the people that was with this group was the same woman who had been trapped up in the bathroom on Michael's floor. And so Michael put his arm around her and was just kind of being comforting and they start walking together. And Michael realized she was very shaken up by the bodies she had seen outside. And even though Michael was very shaken up by it too, he comforted her and said, you know, we gotta keep going, we gotta keep going. And so the two of them just kept on going until they see up ahead, there's an emergency worker with a glow stick kind of waving people to go, go, go towards the stairs, get up on the street, get out of here, evacuate as quickly as possible. And so Michael and this woman, they run right past the emergency worker. They're not even asking any questions at this point. They just want to get away from whatever it is that's going on. And so they get to the base of the stairs when Michael hears this really loud cracking sound coming from somewhere outside. And so Michael and this woman, they run up the stairs, they get out to the street and outside, it's totally chaos. There's people running around everywhere. There are papers all over the ground and other office furnishings. There are things on fire. And Michael just instinctively looks to his right. He looks down the road because that's generally where he thought he heard that really loud cracking sound coming from. And so he found himself looking at the Millennium Hotel, which is this beautiful hotel on the other side of the road from where he was standing a little ways down to the right. And the windows of the front of the Millennium Hotel are like mirrors. They're very reflective. And he found himself just looking at the reflection on the Millennium Hotel. And he noticed it was reflecting the South Tower. And the South Tower was basically across the street from the Millennium Hotel, basically a half block to the right of where Michael and this woman were. And as he's staring at this reflection of the South Tower, he suddenly realizes what that loud cracking sound was. 
It was the sound of the South Tower, which was still full of hundreds and hundreds of people collapsing. And so Michael is watching this South Tower collapse through this reflection on the front of the Millennium Hotel. He snaps out of it and turns and he and the woman just run back down into the mall as fast as they can. They can hear this unbelievably loud sound of thousands and thousands of tons of just metal crashing down almost directly on top of them. And Michael makes it to the bottom of the stairs in the mall and just leaps onto his stomach and covers his head. And he's yelling his wife and his son's name because that's all he can think about. And then suddenly everything goes black. And at the same time, suddenly his mouth, his ears, his nose, everything is just packed with what felt like sand, when in reality it was this white dust that was made from the collapse of the South Tower. And it was made up of pulverized concrete and asbestos and other very toxic chemicals. So as all these building materials are falling down into the mall, also there was this rush of this white dust. And so Michael is just laying there, he can barely breathe, and he's hearing all these big pieces of metal come smashing down all around him, and he's getting ready mentally to just die at any moment. But after a few agonizing seconds, the sounds of the falling materials from the South Tower began to cease after the collapse was basically done, and suddenly Michael began to hear the sound of other people crying and moaning. And so Michael suddenly was acutely aware that he had survived the collapse of the South Tower, but now was almost certainly going to die a slow and horrible death trapped underneath all of this debris. And so in total darkness, Michael just began trying to pull his arms and legs out from whatever it was that was on top of him. And amazingly, he got all of his limbs out. And right away, he began trying to pull the soot and this dust out of his nose and his mouth and his ears. And as soon as his mouth was clear, he began vomiting. And then he was trying to catch his breath. But every breath he took in, there was all this smoke in the air. So it was very hard to breathe. And so Michael managed to rip off his shirt, which was already soaked from the sprinklers when they first came in. And he wrapped it around his head so it was a little bit easier to breathe. And so breathing through his shirt, Michael finally composes himself. And then Michael, he's thinking to himself, I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now, but I know I need to move. And so he just started crawling. He has no idea where he's going. It is truly pitch black, but he's just kind of low crawling up and down and over things. He doesn't know where he's going. And then there's this miracle. He sees a little ways away from him, a light comes on. He didn't know what this light was, but he's in survival mode. And at this point, light represents hope. And so he just started crawling towards this light and he managed to go up and over all this debris. And finally he gets to this clearing where this light is. And it turns out the light was a flashlight held by a fireman who had also survived the collapse of the South Tower. And so Michael crawls over right near this guy and realizes he can stand up. There's enough clearance. He stands up and he looks at this fireman who's this big guy with a mustache. And Michael says to him, what are we going to do now? And so this fireman apparently was remarkably composed and he doesn't really say much to Michael. Instead, he just pulls his ax off his shoulder and kind of gestures for Michael to follow him. And so Michael naturally follows this fireman. And so he leads them over to this wall and the fireman reaches out and he rubs the wall with his glove and he rubs away a lot of soot and dirt to reveal a glass window. And so he tells Michael to stand back and the fireman winds up and he smashes this window. And on the other side of this window is this Borders bookstore. And in the middle of this Borders bookstore is a staircase that goes up to the main floor and out onto the street. And so Michael thanked this fireman and then climbed through this opening into this bookstore. And as he was climbing through, he looked back towards the rubble and he saw there were lots of other people that were crawling out of the rubble and were getting in line to also climb into the bookstore. And so Michael, once he was through, he waited for a few people and then they together ran to the staircase. They went up to the first floor and they went out to the street. And when they got out there, it was like the apocalypse. There was that white dust over everything, over people, cars, buildings, everything. They could barely see in front of them. And so Michael just reflexively began running away from the towers. And as he's running, he sees there's this woman just standing in the road and she's weeping. And Michael goes up to her and he says, are you okay? Can I help you? And she is totally non-responsive. And so eventually Michael just leaves her and keeps on running. And after a couple of seconds, he sees there's this overturned food cart on the side of the road. So there's no one nearby. He runs over. He gets two iced teas out of the cooler. He opens one and pours it over his face to kind of clear his face off. And then he pours some into his mouth to wash his mouth out. And then he just keeps on running. And again, everything around him is just covered in this dust. And so as he's running, he eventually sees there's this cameraman that's got his camera trained in the direction of the towers. But the cameraman is not using his camera. Instead, he's hunched over his camera and he's just weeping like he can't even report the news. And so Michael just kept on running and running. And at some point, he heard another very loud cracking sound behind him. 
but he didn't even turn around. He just kept on running. And it would turn out it was the sound of his tower, the North Tower, collapsing as well. And just like the South Tower, there were hundreds of people inside it when it fell. And so Michael would eventually just continue running until he reached New York University, NYU. That was where his brother was working, and he hoped he would be there so he could tell him that he survived, that he was okay. But when he got to NYU, his brother wasn't there. However, there were staff people there that saw how horrible Michael looked. He was covered head to toe in the dust. He looked crazed. He had blood all over him. And so they took him in, they cleaned him up, and they gave him a phone. And he was able to get in touch with his wife. And he told her that he was okay. And his wife and his entire family, they were convinced he was dead. They had been watching on TV. They had seen the tower collapse. They knew he was up on the 81st floor. And so they really believed he was dead. But unbelievably, he survived. Michael would ultimately make a full physical recovery, although he would have to have several surgeries to remove the 147 pieces of fiberglass that had embedded in his eyes. Because when the tower collapsed and all that dust and soot got pushed into his mouth and his ears and his nose and his eyes, there were little pieces of fiberglass that basically turned into splinters on his eyes. Like most other 9-11 survivors, Michael thinks to himself, you know, why me? Why did I survive when so many other people didn't? But Michael tries not to dwell on that. Instead, he focuses on trying to honor the memories of the people they lost, and he focuses on trying to be the best father to his. sons he can possibly be. So that's going to do it guys. Before you leave, please go into the description and check out the links to the charities I provided. These are extremely highly rated charities that are still providing support to 9-11 victims, their families, and first responders. The ripple effects of this attack are still felt today by lots of people. And so these charities I've identified are a way to support people that really need it. And so I have already donated to all of the charities listed. So I'm telling you, these are incredible organizations. They are worth giving your money to. And so that's going to do it, guys. Until next time.